Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. For those who grew up in the church like I did, you may remember singing that song in Sunday school. How many remember that song? That's a lot of hands. I find this Sunday school song really interesting, partly because there are a lot of characters in the Bible who get a lot more airtime than Zacchaeus does, but they don't get a song written about them. Zacchaeus, he gets a song written about him after just a mere 10 verses. Uh, And there really honestly wasn't much that I knew about Zacchaeus aside from what I learned from that song from my childhood. That Zacchaeus was a wee little man. That's just another way to say that he's short, right? And that he climbed in a sycamore tree. And I know that this isn't a sycamore tree, but, but we can pretend. So he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. <clears throat> but there's a lot in that song that, that gets left out. There's a lot at play underneath that that delightful children's tune that raises a lot of questions for me. Where did all of this happen? If he was short, why didn't he just make his way to the front of the crowd like we do in other settings here even today? And why, the, the important question for us now today is what does a short man in a tree have to teach us about stewardship, radical generosity, and community? So I hope that our walk through this text today unveils a little bit more of what's at play underneath this song. And as we begin this walk through our text, I'd like to pause for a moment of prayer. Lord, bless this time we share together and be present with us while we work to understand your call on our lives. Give us all ears to hear and hearts to receive your message for us today. Amen. So Lamar started off our worship today by talking about stewardship, and that's a word that I've thrown around already during our time this morning. And I think before we go any further, it'd be helpful to establish a working definition of stewardship for our time together. And the definition that I have adopted and that I use to shape my understanding of these matters is that stewardship is everything you do after you say, I believe. Stewardship is about organizing our lives in such a way that God can do the most with us. And now this definition of stewardship doesn't limit our conversation to talks about financial generosity. It it encourages us to open ourselves to the leading of the Spirit in all aspects of our lives. Being a follower of Jesus does not mean that we are disassociated from the realities of this world. However, it does mean that we behave and use our resources in a different way than our neighbor who is not a follower of Jesus. So, as we read through this passage for today, I want us to consider what does this mean to our whole lives. What is this passage saying to our whole lives? And so we're gonna, we're gonna walk through the text and I'd invite you if you have your Bible to open it to Luke 19 and if you take out your phone, I assume that your Bible is on your phone and you're not texting anybody else. So, <clears throat> so turn to Luke 19 if you have it. Verse one, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So this vignette occurs uh, while Jesus and his disciples are in Jericho on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And now if you look ahead a few verses, you know that when the travelers reach Jerusalem, Jesus is met with a crowd of people shouting hosannas, waving palm branches, a Sunday that we mark in our current tradition as Palm Sunday with the waving of branches. That event is commonly referred to as the triumphal entry, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem that event that sets into motion the rest of the events that lead to Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion later that week. Our text is happening very close to the end of Jesus' life and ministry, and this walk through Jericho is just another one of the many towns that Jesus and his disciples went through teaching and preaching on the kingdom. 
But there's something different about the experience in Jericho as compared to the other places they visited. Jesus isn't stopping to teach or or tell any parables. Uh, In fact, the only people that we know Jesus talked to in Jericho was was a beggar outside the city gate and Zacchaeus. So Jesus' fame as a teacher and preacher had surely spread to Jericho at this point. And a crowd was present to greet him as he neared the city. And that crowd that greeted him would have likely wanted to extend hospitality to these folks that were traveling, providing food and lodging for the night as was customary in their culture. Uh, But the text today quickly points out that Jesus was passing through This intention from Jesus to simply pass through is a signal to those in Jericho that he is not going to be spending the night with them. He's not going to be eating at the banquet they likely provided for him. His goal is to keep moving. Now the crowd is likely disappointed in this reality, but chooses to walk alongside Jesus as long as they can, hoping to gain whatever wisdom possible from Jesus during his short visit to Jericho. Now, verse 2 introduces us to Zacchaeus. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. I do want to point out, too, I've been using the NIV translation if it's a little different in your Bibles. But there was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, as you may be aware from other stories throughout Scripture, tax collectors are not the most popular people. Tax collectors were collaborators with the Roman Empire. They were Jews who made their living by collecting taxes from other Jews. Tax collectors would go around the community collecting these taxes from residents and send it up the chain to Rome. And if a tax collector was going to make a living doing this, they would collect a little more than was necessary to pay their own salaries. As, and some collect, tax collectors certainly made more than a living, collecting more than was necessary and padding their own pockets. And that work would quickly and perhaps intentionally isolate a Jew in his community. And it would have been bad enough that Zacchaeus was a tax collector, but he was a chief tax collector. This means that he is a supervisor in this corrupt system. He oversaw other tax collectors in the region. This would have made him all the more despised by his community. And the passage today also makes sure to point out that he was wealthy. This means that he was really good at his job, if you can say that exploiting your friends and neighbors to make a profit is good. This line of work certainly does not make Zacchaeus very popular, certainly doesn't make him very respected. He's engaged in work that's dirty and underhanded, that makes him despised by his Jewish neighbors. And I think this is really ironic for Zacchaeus to have such a role in his community, considering his name in Hebrew means clean and pure. So although we can make a lot of assumptions about Zacchaeus based on his occupation and wealth, I think we get a true glimpse of Zacchaeus' character in the third verse. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Zacchaeus displays a genuine curiosity in the figure of Jesus. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. That's the part of the story that we already knew. Verse 4. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now there are a few significant pieces of that verse that inform how we view and interpret this story. In his book, uh, Through Middle Eastern Eyes, Kenneth Bailey explores Middle Eastern social and cultural implications around the stories that we read in scripture. And his insights into the actions of Zacchaeus are particularly fascinating for me. The first, he ran ahead. Bailey shares that a Middle Eastern man at the time would never have been caught running, particularly a wealthy man. Being seen running in public would have resulted in shame, would have taken the honor away from his family, and in a culture largely based on honor and shame, this was very significant. Furthermore, Bailey writes, furthermore, powerful rich men do not climb trees. 
So both of the actions described in verse 4 show Zacchaeus' dedication to finding a way to see Jesus as he passes by, even if it sacrifices these other pieces for him. So Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore fig tree. Now the tree that Zacchaeus chose to climb, I think is also an important detail in the story. The sycamore fig tree is a large tree with low branches. Again, we're just using our imagination up here. But a large tree with low branches, making it very easy to climb. And the tree also would have had these dense, broad leaves that would have made it very easy to hide in. But a piece of information that's also interesting is the presumed location of this tree. Sycamore fig trees were only allowed to be planted out of town. Because of the low sprawling branches, they may have interfered with buildings or with the city walls, so they were only allowed to be planted out of town. So they didn't interfere with those structures. Additionally, this tree would have been considered unclean in the Jewish tradition, and it often would serve as a type of tent for unclean rituals to happen beneath its branches, thus making anything under these branches, or in the case of this story, in these branches, also unclean. So, we know that Zacchaeus ran far enough ahead to make it some distance out of town, and he climbed a tree. And perhaps Zacchaeus chose that particular tree because of its ability for him to climb, Perhaps it was because of those leaves that made it easy to hide in. Or perhaps it was because he thought that by the time they got to that tree, maybe the crowd would have dissipated. This would have given him a better chance of seeing Jesus, but it also would have mitigated the chances of somebody seeing him. But regardless of the motivation, we find Zacchaeus in the branches of a sycamore fig tree as Jesus passes by. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. I want to back up to when Jesus first entered Jericho. It said that Jesus was passing through. And remember at the time, the devout Jews in Jericho would have wanted to offer hospitality. Come to our house, lodge with us, eat at the banquet we've prepared. And Jesus had intended to keep right on moving. And if the tree that Zacchaeus climbed was indeed outside of the city along the road that Jesus was walking, we could assume that Jesus' visit to Jericho is already done. He's already passed through by the time he reaches this spot. His brief visit to Jericho has already come to an end. But Jesus stops and calls Zacchaeus out of the tree and invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. And it says that Zacchaeus came down and welcomed him gladly. I think there is another indication of Zacchaeus' true character. Anybody who welcomes Jesus into their home gladly can't be all bad, right? But all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus had politely refused the hospitality offered by the devout Jews in town, and now he has invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, likely to eat and lodge for the night. This man, Zacchaeus, who has abused his community and his fellow Jews, is now playing host to the Messiah? I might have grumbled a little bit too. So Zacchaeus came down out of the tree and led Jesus to his home. And he likely went about preparing a meal and making sure that his guest accommodations were prepared, clean sheets on the bed, fresh towels laid out, the Wi-Fi password prominently displayed. <laughs> Maybe not that last one, but you know, all the things that you do when, ex- when unexpected house guests arrive. And I imagine that the next verse picks up after they had eaten and had lounged at the table for a bit. Zacchaeus stood up and said, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And now we read this, and we don't think very carefully about this declaration and what it means. This was a bold claim for Zacchaeus to make, and I've wondered 
to myself, and perhaps it's because of my work at Everance, what would Zacchaeus' financial advisor have said after this bold claim? I imagine him sitting down and saying, Zach, I, I'm here serving as your financial advisor. I'm here to help you make sure you're thinking rationally about your money and not making any, any bold moves just based on emotions. So what is it that you want to do after your encounter with this traveling prophet? Well, sure, there are a few things that you could change in your business practices to make you more respected in the community, but really liquidating and distributing half of your net worth, is that really a good idea? What if, what if you take some of that and putting it into a, a socially responsibly invested portfolio? Then you can feel good about the money that, no, you don't want to do that. Well, have you thought about securing your own future through opening a Roth IRA? How, what are you going to do after you retire from tax collecting? Well, have you thought about uh, preparing for long-term care? What happens if you have to end up in Jericho Manor? You might need some of that money. Okay, so you, don't, you really want to give it away. Well, surely you're not going to give it right back to the people. Channel it through a 501c3 so you make sure to get a tax deduction. You as a tax collector know the tax implications. I say all this not to step on the toes of my colleagues at Everance. I think all of those questions are good questions to be asking. I just say this to illustrate how completely ridiculous this, this claim from Zacchaeus is, this bold declaration is something that we would never dream of doing or advise somebody to do. This is a, this is a bold statement from Zacchaeus. And Jesus responds to him in verses 9 and 10 saying that today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. This radical thing that Zacchaeus did is extremely costly for Zacchaeus, but he boldly declares his intention, and Jesus says today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Now Zacchaeus was a Jewish man, but he had been separated from his community because of the line of work that he was in. He was an outcast. He was set apart from the Jewish community. But the words that Jesus speaks to him are words of restoration. Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham. This, of course, is a statement that applies to his salvation, but also provides restoration of community for Zacchaeus. Jesus' statement means that Zacchaeus is not just another tax collector, another sinner, but that he is a real Jew again. As we consider what this passage has to teach us about community and stewardship and generosity, I want to look at the three characters that are in this text. Jesus, Zacchaeus, and the crowd. And I want to start with the crowd. The crowd's greed for Jesus' attention blinded them to the grace that Jesus poured out on Zacchaeus. The crowd had the opportunity to be in the transformative power of Jesus' grace, but much like other crowds from scriptures who considered themselves devout, they let their understanding of the way things should be separate them from the moment that was taking place right in front of them. They were too busy grumbling about Jesus spending his time with a sinner to recognize what was really happening. How often do we let ourselves become a part of the crowd? How often do we let our understanding of the way things should be blind us from the powerful acts of grace that surround us every day? How often do we mutter and grumble? We as believers should be actively searching for the moments of transformation that are happening around us. We should resist that temptation to grumble. We should reframe our thinking to be more present in our own lives. We need to constantly work to open ourselves to witness Christ's transforming power that's at work in our homes, in our church, in our communities, and in our world. And in the world we live in today, it's really easy to become discouraged. Our world is filled with violence and full of people drawing lines in the sand. It's tempting for me during troubling times to hold tighter to my truth, to close myself off to the world and to approach others with a spirit of skepticism and suspicion. But stewardship is about organizing my life in such a way that God can do the most with me. 
The call to holistic stewardship is one that invites us to turn from that skepticism and suspicion to a spirit of openness and gratitude. And that lesson's not only applicable for us on our personal journey, but to the journey of our communities. How do we, as communities of faith, walk alongside each other and model for each other what holistic stewardship looks like? The crowd in today's story gave us a great example of how not to do that. Turning our attention to the role of Jesus in this story, in the middle of our story, Jesus offers costly love to Zacchaeus. Now, if you walk through the story from the beginning, we can see that Zacchaeus was a person whom the crowd did not like. In verse 5, Jesus shifts that hostility away from Zacchaeus and takes it upon himself. The people begin to mutter not because of Zacchaeus. They already didn't like him. They begin to mutter because of Jesus' extension of grace and demonstration of love. Through inviting himself to the house of a sinner, Jesus takes the hostility of the crowd upon himself. Through eating Zacchaeus' unclean food, from sleeping in his unclean guest bed, Jesus offers to Zacchaeus a costly gift of love and acceptance. And how does Zacchaeus respond? Zacchaeus offers costly love to others. It's love that motivates Zacchaeus to make his gift. He does not choose to give away half of his possessions because it's a smart financial move or because it's expected of him or even because it makes sense because it doesn't. Zacchaeus responds to Jesus' gift in a radical way as an act of love and appreciation. That response of radical love and appreciation through the giving of gifts uh, I think is similar to the actions that we read back in the book of Exodus when Moses was helping organize the construction of the tabernacle and he sent out a call for support and invited folks to respond by giving gifts. And the response was so overwhelming that not long after the call had gone out for donations, Moses sends out another call saying, stop, we have enough. In Exodus 36, 6, it says that the people were restrained from bringing more. The people had to be convinced not to bring more gifts. That's not something I've heard from the pulpit on Sunday morning at Heston Mennonite Church. (laughs) The people were so moved by love and appreciation that they couldn't contain their giving. These acts of love and appreciation through the giving of gifts goes beyond percentage calculations or deciphering where one can find indirect gain through a charitable tax deduction. It's an act of worship. And I think that's the most important lesson that we can learn from Zacchaeus, to let our actions and to let our gifts come from a place of genuine love, and granted that love can at times be costly. It can cause us at times to do things that might be considered crazy, but if our actions and our gifts come from a place of love and appreciation, it really doesn't matter if it's crazy. After his encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus gave in love and joy, and I ask you today, How will you respond to the costly love that Jesus has offered you? How will you respond to the costly love that Jesus has offered you? And one way of responding that we have in this community is through our intention to give forms that you've brought with you this Sunday or that you'll return to the church office at a later time after that sort of discernment in your household. And just like this gift from Zacchaeus, the, the intention to give form is not, some, is not some means of calculating your gift to a congregation to keep the lights on and to keep the heat on and things like that. No, this is an act of worship. It's your way of showing your dedication to this community, to this body, and engaging in this, in this act together as a group is a way of bonding us together in, in a meaningful way. And, and again, this isn't about the numbers. It's about this act of love and appreciation that we get to engage in as a group. 
So in a moment, Ken is going to play some music for us, and I invite you with your intention to give when you're ready to bring that forward and place it in the bowl beneath the tree. Sometimes we may find ourselves in the tree. Sometimes we may find ourselves as the part of the crowd. But regardless of where you are today, I hope that this can be a meaningful experience linking you to this community. So as we close, let's pray together. God, be with us as we move along on our faith journey. Whether we are standing in the crowd or hiding in a tree, send us your spirit so we might have wisdom in our daily walk. Give us the vision to see your transformative work that surrounds us each and every day. Help us to demonstrate and share our gifts as good stewards so we may use them in love and in service in your kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.